I'm Matt Hogan, President of ETF Analytics and Global Head of Editorial at Index Universe, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'm pleased to be joined on the line today by two true experts in the space, Jim Lowell, Forbes columnist, noted author, and CIO of Advisor Investments, a private money management firm with more than $1 billion in advised assets, and Jason Toussaint, who is Managing Director for the World Gold Council and without question one of the smartest and most sensible people involved in gold investing today. I'm very excited about today's webinar, which is the latest in a new monthly series of webinars we call the Alpha Beta Series. For these webinars, we are partnering with leading advisors and experts to provide complete 360-degree analysis of how to invest in different asset classes using ETFs. The format today is straightforward. Jim and I, Jim is going to kick things off with a 15-minute presentation covering how he approaches precious metals, including how he researches the space and decides to over or underweight gold and or silver. Jason will follow with a short set of slides addressing some of the fundamentals of today's gold market, and together, Jason and Jim will cover the alpha segment of the presentation. I'll then jump in with my beta portion, which is a short 10 to 15 minute presentation on understanding and evaluating gold and silver related ETFs. Following the presentation, we'll open things up for Q&A. And as a participant in this webinar, you can enter questions for Jim, Jason, or I using the comments tool on your webinar screen. I'd say please don't wait till the end of the presentations to ask questions. Just submit those questions as they occur to you. We'll collate them and answer as many as we can at the end. For those of you who are interested in seeing the slides of this presentation, they'll be available along with a recording of the presentation approximately two to three days from now. We will alert you to their availability via email. And for those of you who have registered for CE credits, information on how to qualify for those credits will be sent to you by email as well. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Jim Lowell uh, to kick us off on the alpha portion of our webinar. Jim? Thanks, Matt. I am certainly looking forward to hearing both your views on the sector as well as Jason's. My view is Chief Investment Officer of Advisor Investments, where we actually oversee about $2.4 in assets under management, is that gold obviously has its days in the sun and then its days in uh, the dark corner of the closet where nobody wants to be reminded of the fact that they had once owned gold uh, and ridden it down. Lately, it seems, of course, that gold could do nothing but go up. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how I view uh, gold's current and future prospects and also how inside of our portfolios we have one core weighting that really does a lot of the, the bidding and the asking in terms of gold prices for us to an expertly, actively manage fund that has a position in both uh, gold and in, uh, in currencies. When I look at gold, uh, I'm reminded, of course, of the history of its volatility, and we are right now back towards uh, the peak pricing level of that precious metal uh, compared to about 29 years ago, the last time gold really rocketed ahead of virtually every other asset class. And those were the days when inflation and hyperinflation weren't just uh, theoretical concerns. They, they were real and present in the marketplace. I would say that over the last uh, decade, but then certainly over the last three years, uh, the price of gold has been largely driven by a fear trade, uh, a fear of not just sort of the end of the world. I think we now understand that the world uh, is beginning to swing back and to towards a, a cyclical recovery, uh, but also in terms of the fear of the U.S. dollar uh, going the way of, of wallpaper in terms of value, and also the fear of the dollar being threatened by other commodities in the space, in particular oil. So I'm never thinking about gold just as an absolute, but always as its uh, relative strength or weakness compared to other asset classes that may or may not provide uh, equal amounts of investment opportunity. When I look at gold, uh, I'm also reminded of the fact that, you know, I have to ask myself, what what is gold? Uh, it is clearly not a company, not a sector, not an economy, not even a municipality. So it's very hard to put a fundamental value on the price of gold and very hard to model what the future price of gold might look like. 
Uh, and that is uh, one way in which I almost always address uh, those who are very interested in investing in gold, uh, which tends to be right about now when gold has done nothing but go up. And it, it is to remind them that gold really trades on a psychological rather than a fundamental metric. I talked about the fear trade. I think there's something else that's been going on in the last three years, and that is an allocation trade, uh, an allocation not just by individual investors into gold, but also an allocation into gold by professional investment advisors on behalf of their clients, either because their clients were clamoring for it or because they did some fundamental research in terms of their overall portfolio and figured that gold, at least in small measure, could play an effective role in the overall asset allocation of the portfolio. Um, we're also now at that point where, in addition to fear and allocation trades uh, being present, uh, we're seeing greed uh, wed to what I would say is a, an option of a currency alternative or an alternate currency expressed in the main by metric ton acquisitions from uh, governments, not just, not just our own, India, Russia, looking for ways to basically hedge their, their own uh, currency and what they forecast as potential currency weakness going forward. So there's a lot of momentum in the space. There's a lot of heated interest in the space, but there's really not an industrial application for that metal, unlike silver, which at least has the case of an industrial application that one can measure. For example, you can't build catalytic converters without quantities of silver. Uh, but silver, even though it has some fundamental attributes that may be attractive, given that we are, I think, on a recovery track, uh, despite those fundamentals, silver almost always has, and I think likely will continue to, trade on a multiple uh, relative to the price of gold. And so if we could just go with our first slide. Um, this is just a quick look at how uh, silver and a gold ETF versus the markets have been behaving. Um, not a too, uh, I'm sure it's not a surprise to anyone that both gold and silver have had a tremendous run-up versus the market. Um, and I bet it's not a surprise to our educated uh, members that uh, we also have seen silver have a tremendous uh, recent leg up over uh, the precious metal. Part of that was due to the fact that it really hadn't caught up to the momentum in gold uh, pricing. And uh, part of it is that I think, again, you've got the allocation trade in tandem with the fear and the greed trade going on. Uh, the next slide, if we could move to it, shows us quickly how Gold has basically been behaving versus uh, not exactly the price of oil. Uh, I use the uh, United States oil ETF, which has a uh, relatively poor uh, performance history compared to actually tracking the price of oil. That said, uh, it's the most uh, liquid investment for individuals and investment advisors who are looking for a way to own oil. And so I thought it was relevant to put uh, that into this mix. And we see, again, that gold has just had this phenomenal uh, track record of outperformance. Recently, that record has uh, flipped a little bit the first quarter of this year, uh, heavily in favor of oil prices due to, uh, in, that, in that space, again, a fear trade having been made manifest thanks to the uh, uh, destabilization, the ongoing destabilization in the Middle East. Um, the next slide uh, just is a quick snapshot of gold versus Alternate currencies, um, one of the great advantages that the exchange traded fund universe brings to an investment table is the ability to participate in currencies uh, around the world and in some very interesting verticals. I have this chart just to remind us that gold really has been bought by many countries as an alternative currency, uh, but it certainly does not trade anything like a currency. Um, for those of you who think that uh, the currency market is a volatile place to trade in and out of, one simply has to look at the chart to see that gold's volatility is almost 2x your average currency volatility. So certainly not for the uninformed nor faint of heart. Um, and then the next slide brings us to gold versus dollar. Um, here I use the power shares uh, dollar bull, symbol UUP, an, an ETF that that many advisors and investors use as a way to play the dollar um, versus gold and versus the red line of the market. Uh, what we are seeing, again, is that gold has just had this tremendous and consistent and 
long lived run against uh, what had been viewed as uh, the almighty dollar. And I put all of these uh, in our path just to remind us that gold has done nothing but uh, go up on a consistent basis relative to currency, relative to oil, relative to dollar, um, and uh, even up until very recently relative to silver. Uh, my outlook for gold is uh, almost an inverse uh, read of these uh, of the these four charts that we've looked at, and I'm currently fairly bearish on gold. The reasons for that uh, in some are that I'm fairly bullish about the ability of the global economic recovery to sustain itself, not evenly, not in a simple hockey stick manner, uh, but in a stair step uh, progression that I think will increasingly favor fundamentals and equities as opposed to speculation on what certainly looks like a very highly valued price on gold currently. So in, the, uh, in my Forbes ETF advisor, which is a newsletter that focuses on exchange traded funds, um, we ha I have a, actually a buy on an ultra short gold uh, ETF, ProShares Ultra Short Gold, symbol GLL, and a buy on ProShares Ultra Silver, a pairing strategy, and if we can move to the next slide, um, it is a pairing strategy that has served us demonstrably well since we initiated it. Uh, basically, I've been wrong and wrongly bearish on gold for quite a while, uh, despite the fact that what we have seen in the marketplace has been nothing but, uh, I suppose, in hindsight, reasons for owning more and more of it. Um, but I also felt that I probably was early and wrong on my call uh, for uh, being bearish about gold, and so I wanted to be able to go ultra long uh, silver as a way to effectively hedge my bet against uh, gold. And so this chart just shows that owning an equal position in ultra silver, ultra short gold, you would have made uh, significantly more money than if you had just been long either the market or simply long gold. So there are ways to trade. Uh, around gold, I prefer pr uh, a pairing strategy like this in order to do it. Um, there are also ways when, when and if we actually begin to see the fear trade dissipate, the allocation trades dissipate, uh, and global government consumption of gold dissipate, there are ways to be able to participate in uh, shorting uh, the gold market, um, but it is a, a very speculative endeavor at best. I said at the outset, and I'm, I'm close to uh, bumping up on my timeline, that I'd mention the one way that we uh, at Advisor Investments uh, basically manage gold inside of our uh, portfolios, and that's through a fund called BlackRock Global Asset Allocation, uh, symbol M-A-L-O-X, very suitably. Uh, it's, a, it's a globally diversified, balanced fund that has a nice, big, deep vertical in uh, in commodities, and inside of that, gold is certainly certainly plays a role, uh, nearly about 5% of that, that overall portfolio. Uh, the reason why we use BlackRock is that Dennis Statman, the manager of that fund, has multi-decades of experience managing not just the equity and the bond markets globally, but also the currency and uh, the gold markets therein. And I rely often on active managers whose track records I know to make smarter calls on what remains a very volatile space. Matt, I'll hand it back to you. That, that was great, Jim. Thanks so much. I know Jason's definitely going to have uh, some opinions about what you said, as well as uh, some of his slides of, of his own. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Jason Toussaint, Managing Director for the World Gold Council. Uh, a reminder to participants, feel free to enter questions to us at any time. We'll collate them and answer them at the end. Uh, Jason, take it away. Uh, thanks a lot, Matt, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you uh, this afternoon, uh, especially those of you who are in New York and uh, looking out the window. It's uh, tempting to uh, to bail on this call, so thank you for staying. Um, I have uh, a number of uh, slides that uh, that I've been asked to uh, to present to the audience today, but uh, before I dig into those, I'd like to. Uh, perhaps give a, a bit of context uh, around what the Gold Council is, uh, what we do here, and what my role within it is. 
And uh, the World Gold Council is a uh, the market development organization for the gold industry. We are owned and funded by gold mining companies. Uh, and for lack of a better term, we are the, uh, the people who interface, if you will, on the demand side uh, of the equation uh, across uh, four primary sectors, uh, those being the investment sector, government affairs, uh, of course, the jewelry sector, um, and, uh, and uh, industrial. Uh, and I'll come back to kind of what the demand uh, and supply profile looks. Uh, across the uh, the market in those specific sectors uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, I manage the uh, the u s and the investment uh, business here in the u s and also am the uh, executive officer of the spider uh, gold shares the uh, sponsored by world gold trust services here uh, in the u s so for full disclosure um, if we could go into the uh, the presentation deck now that would be great, starting with looking at some of the uh, the merits for gold investment. I should add that our role is not to sell gold uh, to anyone in the market. It is merely to help educate uh, investors and potential investors looking at and analyzing the merits of gold investment within their portfolios. Uh, so we do a lot of research pieces, uh, many of those uh, posted on our website, et cetera, for your, uh, for your information. So when we look at uh, what is the role of gold within a portfolio, of course, we need to look at how it correlates and co-varies with other existing assets. So what we've got here is a table of correlations of uh, gold and other major asset classes uh, in U.S. investor portfolios. And you can see, interestingly, there's obviously very low correlations. Um, and in fact, against the uh, uh, the MSCI US or S&P 500, the correlation is statistically uh, zero. Uh, so when we're talking in terms of diversifying portfolio level assets, gold is a, uh, a very uh, diversifying asset, which is important. I'd also note uh, your attention to the uh, the second to the last bar. Uh, the uh, S&P GSCI, the correlation between that and gold is extremely low as well. Uh, so one of the things we focus on is not only the merits of gold uh, in a portfolio, but also versus other uh, commodities and commodity indices. And there's some uh, interesting insights there as well. Moving on to the, to the next page, instead of um, looking necessarily at kind of a static average correlation, we do look at what occurs in extreme events, so tail risk events, both in, in positive rising markets uh, and declining markets. So we're looking at the, uh, the correlation between uh, equities, gold, and commodities when equities move by more than two standard deviations uh, over this time period from uh, 87 to uh, 2010. Uh, July. So on the top bars, these are periods when the S&P 500 has weekly returns uh, greater than two standard deviations. You can see the correlation between gold and the S&P 500 is slightly positive, again, close to zero. Uh, and again, the correlation between the GSCI and the S&P 500 fairly uh, marginally higher. I think what's most interesting on this page, however, is in extreme sell-off events, we can find that gold, because of its st uh, stability uh, factor and this flight to quality trade, if you will, uh, during periods of uh, market turmoil, uh, we do find an increasing negative correlation between equities and gold. Uh, however, interestingly, you would find that that is not the case for the commodity complex overall as measured by, again, the GSCI, uh, where there is an even stronger correlation between S&P and commodities. That does have implications for us who are investing for the long run and through uh, not trying to time our, uh, market time our way out of market cycles. Now, the next page, when we're looking at inflation, uh, what we've done here is defined inflation as periods where U.S. CPI is uh, greater than 5%. We can debate uh, whether periods of uh, inflation lower than that are, are considered, quote, unquote, high inflation. Uh, but for this study, we've done uh, that sort of analysis. We can see that 
during these periods of high inflation back from 1973 through current day, uh, that gold has dramatically outperformed most other asset classes in these inflationary years. Having said that, uh, I'm sure everybody looking at this chart can notice the nice spike in 1979, which does, of course, skew the, uh, the results. Um, gold does tend to have a, uh, an inflationary uh, hedging aspect to it. Is it a perfect hedge against inflation? No, I don't think so, and I'm not sure there is a perfect uh, one out there. Uh, but it does have a role, again, uh, within the overall portfolio context. Now, when we look at uh, gold versus the dollar on the next slide, uh, what we've done is looked at, for the past decade, uh, the relationship between the trade-weighted dollar and gold. Uh, and over time, uh, we do see that gold has a, a fairly strong correlation, a negative 0.8 correlation, in fact, to the U.S. dollar. Um, some would look to the period of uh, 2009 and say, well, you know, that kind of broke down, so what was going on then? And if we recall, this was uh, still in the midst of the, the global crisis. Unfortunately, uh, all currencies around the world were um, not doing well, uh, for lack of a better term. The U.S. dollar uh, was the best of the currencies. So there was a flight not only to gold, but to the U.S. dollar uh, as a reserve currency. So that correlation or the negative correlation broke down for a period of time. Uh, and we do that, see that returning to uh, normal now. So again, long-term investors who are looking to hedge dollar exposure might look to gold as, uh, as one of the alternatives for doing so. When we go to um, the next slide, looking at the role of China and India, uh, it's very compelling what we see where gold demand is coming from. I think. We all have a tendency to try to isolate uh, different impacts and factors that impact an asset price, whether it's gold, corn, or real estate uh, in all assets. But it's very important to recall uh, that gold is truly a global asset and has been for thousands of years. And demand for gold is not necessarily dominated by any one region or any one type of purchaser. In this case, what we've looked at is when we look at China and India, which are the two largest single countries uh, of demand, uh, and we look at jewelry and investment demand coming from there, at the end of 2010, these two countries combined accounted for 40% of total demand uh, for gold. Some people would find that shocking. Uh, for those of you who follow our research, it shouldn't come as a shock. Uh, that has changed dramatically from a decade earlier where the global share of demand was 24%. So wh what is the, the rationale here? Uh, what's going on and will this continue? I think there's a, a couple of things going on which are important to note. In the eastern markets, particularly in China and India, there is a very, very strong cultural affinity towards gold. In India, there are gods and goddesses dedicated to uh, wealth and gold. Um, in the form of jewelry in a market like India, uh, gold jewelry for adornment purposes literally defines women as women. Um, and uh, I've got stories around uh, women begging for food with uh, kind of two wrists full of uh, gold bangles, and I'm scratching my head and saying, why isn't she selling some gold to eat? And I'm told by people who operate in the Indian market that women would rather go without food than to give up their gold. So that's uh, some indication uh, beyond the simple mere statistics on the page in terms of the affinity towards gold in these markets. Combined with that is dramatic, um, as we all know, uh, immense increase in uh, GDP in these countries and newly created wealth. Because there is such a strong affinity towards gold in these markets and throughout the, uh, the Middle East and Asia, this factor is a strategically important one. And I think, from my perspective, uh, the most important factor for the gold price in the next decade. Uh, and because we're talking about uh, rural markets where there's not a lot of transparency on a real-time basis, this factor 
um, goes unreported a lot. Uh, there is a lot of focus, of course, here in the U.S. on the growth of ETFs, etc. The real strategic factor underpinning the gold price from here uh, is what's going on in the physical market in countries halfway around the world. Now, moving on to the uh, the demand side, uh, sorry, the supply side, looking at mine production, uh, mine production has been fairly constant. We can see from 95 through uh, year-end last year, tonnage on the left-hand side and the gold price uh, on the right. Um, there's a number of, uh, of reasons for that, uh, which I will get into on the following page. Uh, prices for extracting gold uh, from the ground continue to increase. So we can see the uh, what does it cost to uh, essentially bring a an ounce of gold to the surface? Um, it shouldn't be any shock that with increasing energy prices, uh, because gold mining is so energy reliant, that their extraction prices go up. At the same time, some of the oldest mines in the world, uh, particularly in South Africa. Over some of these over 20 to 50 years old now, uh, they are over two miles deep into the earth, and the yield or the uh, the grams of gold per ton that they bring to the surface is decreasing. So it's becoming more difficult to find, uh, as we'll see on the next page, um, talking about new discoveries uh, of gold. On the left-hand side is new discoveries on an annual basis, and the red bars. On the right-hand side is the global total global exploration budget by annual, uh, on an annual basis uh, allocated to looking for new sources of gold. We can see that uh, in the midst of this bull market over the past decade, uh, exploration budgets have exploded. Uh, however, they are not yielding um, any more gold. So not only did we start out with gold being a, an extremely rare uh, mineral, it's becoming more scarce. Uh, as I like to say, the easy gold is long gone in the days of picking a nugget up out of a riverbed uh, past decades ago. Uh, so it is becoming an even more precious item and more difficult to bring to the surface. So that's the, uh, if you will, the uh, the 20,000 foot level argument and uh, a snapshot of uh, kind of the supply and demand side uh, of the gold market. Um, I think I, I would wrap up with uh, with a couple of thoughts here. And when we think about the, the primary uses of gold uh, through time, uh, historically they've been mostly around uh, hedging against inflation or U.S. dollar. And I think what is really the new science, if you will, is considering gold literally as an asset class. Um, and what do I mean by that? Of course, purchasing and buying gold has been available for thousands of years, um, but before the advent of the ETFs, um, it was a uh, not a frictionless transaction. So buying um, physical bullion, um, I need to figure out where do I transact in it, how do I transport it, do I need to insure it, how do I store it, etc. It's a it's not necessarily a portfolio level asset and was historically viewed more as a collectible along with uh, perhaps a high price coin collection or art or antiques, etc. And I think because the, uh, the market is now able to access gold uh, through the ETF market, that it is now a viable asset allocation. Um, the world has changed from analyzing gold uh, as a standalone asset and is now looking at relative returns really for the first time between gold and other assets and really the implications and potential benefits of allocating gold to existing portfolios. Uh, and that's really the, uh, the new frontier and where the market is now. So I think I'll end with that. Great, Jason. Thanks. Certainly a lot to dig into between uh, some of the things you're calling out and some of the things Jim's calling out. I'm going to take 10 quick minutes to look at uh, the various ways to play gold and silver, talk about some of those ETFs that you think have uh, fundamentally changed the nature of the, uh, the gold market, Jason, and uh, run through investor choices, and then we'll wrap up with Q&A. Once again, I'll remind everyone to submit questions to Jason, Jim, or I using the comments section on the webinar tab. 
Um, so let's start really quick with some fundamental facts about how investors approach investing in any commodity. Uh, the reality is whether you're choosing among gold, silver, oil, wheat, copper, or greasy wool, you're always faced with a stark choice. Uh, do you want exposure to spot? In this case, that would be physical gold bullion. Uh, do you want exposure to futures, which is often the case in commodities? You, you don't really want to hold 100 barrels of leaky oil in your backyard. Uh, so do you want to use financial instruments that provide a claim on that oil? Uh, or do you want to buy equities? Do you want to buy the gold mining companies or the oil producing companies rather than the oil itself? And the funny thing about commodities is that most of the time, the thing people think they want is spot. Uh, I think everyone in the market has wanted to buy spot oil recently, uh, but you can't. You don't have the physical ability to store uh, something like oil. It, it's messy. It leaks. As a result, in the commodity space, people are often pushed to either the second or third tier, uh, either futures or equities, um, both of which have their problems compared to spot. You know, futures can trade in contango or backwardation. Uh, equities often trade more like equities, uh, more like other stocks than they do like, like bullion. Uh, the, the interesting thing in precious metals is that this equation is kind of tweaked. Uh, in precious metals, you can access all three of these. You can access spot, you can access futures, and you can access uh, equities, either in ETF or, or direct form. And, and the reality is they're all good choices. So in spot market, uh, usually in commodities, you can't buy that. In the, in the precious metal space, that's very easy in an ETF. In the futures market, uh, the effect of contango uh, on precious metals is much smaller than it is um, on oil or ags. Um, so futures are a reasonable choice as well. And even in the equity market, you'll see much higher correlations between gold-producing equities and gold, for instance, than you will between oil-producing companies and oil. Uh, but let's let's talk a little bit about each one of these. You know, Jason covered a bit about the fundamentals of the gold market, but I wanted to add a few of my points. Uh, the first is that the gold market is huge and heavily traded. Uh, about $25 billion worth of gold bullion trades hands each day, uh, most of this taking place on the giant precious metals markets in London uh, between large institutions. And, and silver is similarly large with $4 billion trading hands each day. Uh, in both cases, these are traded assets. The level traded swamps uh, the amount of production we see each year. One sort of core fundamental difference between these markets is that when gold comes out of the ground, it tends to stay out. I think the statistic is that somewhere over 90% of all the gold ever mined still exists. Uh, silver, on the other hand, is consumed. So roughly 45 billion ounces have come out of the ground uh, in silver in recorded history, but maybe only 10% of that exists today. So these are different uh, markets in that sense. So let's talk about accessing those markets. If you're not a large institution trading in London, how do you actually go out there and buy exposure to gold or silver? Uh, historically, the primary way to do this was to get out there and actually put your hands on the physical metal. As Jason said, that's not a frictionless trade. Uh, you can still do that today. You can go to the U.S. Mint. You can go to a physical gold dealer like Kitco. Uh, you can play 20% spreads at Glenn Beck's Gold Line. Uh, but even if you ignore the kind of gouging at, at Gold Line and other firms like that, uh, you know, buying bullion, at least in small amounts, is still expensive. Uh, we've called out some of the costs here, but you can see that commissions can range up to 2%. Uh, there's significant fabrication costs if you're buying a coin. A storage cost, if you have someone store your gold, uh, can run up to 50 basis points per year. And there are major spreads in the gold market, 50 to 100 basis points. Uh, there are cheaper ways to buy gold in, in a physical bullion-based format through gold pools, or you, you get a physical claim on delivery, and you can have that gold delivered in the future for a fee. Uh, but generally, for non-institutional investors uh, outside of the ETF market, uh, buying physical bullion is costly. That's why few people did it before ETFs came around. Um, those who don't want to play in the bullion market often turn to futures, uh, where again, as, as with the gold bullion market, there is huge volume in trading activity. Uh, there's a half year's supply of gold in the futures market, 
where $30 billion trades hands every day. Uh, silver is even bigger on a relative basis with $15 billion trading hands every day. Most of these contracts never physically settle. They are true financial contracts that are settled for cash long before expiration. But this is a big, big market. So is it a good market for investors? Uh, in one sense, yes. I think, as I said earlier, the problems that plague many commodities in the futures market, which is the penchant for con contracts to trade in contango, is not as big a deal in the gold and silver markets. It is absolutely true that these markets tend to trade in contango, uh, but the levels are relatively small. When we looked recently, the annualized cost of a rolling position in gold futures was just 20 basis points. For silver, it was about 37 basis points, although those numbers bounce around a great deal. But the real reason that many people avoid the futures um, market is that it's just large and it's complex. So gold futures trade with a handle of 100 troy ounces, or about $130,000 per contract, and silver futures claim 5,000 ounces, or $150,000 per contract. So you have to be a big player to play in this market, and then you have to constantly manage your exposure, rolling from one contract to the next as each expires. Uh, it's definitely hard work. It's much easier just to buy equities. Equities used to be the only real way most investors would gain exposure to precious metals, and there was a whole science of determining which company had the highest leverage ratio versus either gold or silver bullion. Uh, to this day, a lot of people think gold and silver miners are effectively levered plays on precious metals. This is a pretty big market. The global gold miners index from FTSE totals about $300 billion in market cap. Virtually all of that trades in New York as ADRs, and you can access it via, say, the Vanek Gold Miners ETF, GDX, which captures 275 of that $300 billion, so it's easily accessible. I would note one of the statistics here. Uh, currently, gold mining stocks are priced around a PE of 25, which seems certainly elevated um, given, given what that business really is. Um, there is a second avenue for gold miners that a lot of people explore, which are juniors. Juniors are typically act as levered up, high-risk versions of more senior gold miners. Often they're firms that don't yet have any gold mining operations producing bullion, and they trade more or less on their future hopes um, of discovering bullion at various mining claims. I, the gold and silver mining ETFs have been incredibly successful. GDX from VanEck has more than $6.5 in assets, and the junior version, GDXJ, holds $2.4 billion. Even the silver miners ETF, SIL, has poured in more than $600 million in assets. So people love these things. But there certainly are a few things every investor should understand about buying the miners. Uh, the first one is obvious. These are stocks and not bullion. They tend to have higher correlations to the stock market than a straight play on bullion. Uh, moreover, it appears that the old concept that these funds were levered to the market does not appear to be the case anymore. At least recently, these funds have been muted in their response to developments in the bullion market. This chart, I think, shows that very well. It stretches back about four years. The dark red line on the top is silver. The blue line, the dark blue line, is gold. You can see over the last four years that gold is up about 128%, and silver, incredibly, is up over 200%. And you look how the big mining indexes have done. GDM, which is the index that is tracked by GDX, the gold miners ETF, is up about half as much as the metal itself. It's that silver line up 62%. The same is true of the, of the silver ETF, which is in red, up about 98% against a 214% move in bullion. Even this year, since the start of this year, for instance, silver bullion is up about 30%, while the silver miners ETF is up only about 5%. So the old idea that these were levered plays on the bullion markets, at least recently, hasn't held true. So let's review all the choices in the ETF space. At this point, investors have 26 different ways to play gold and silver using ETFs, a fact that's kind of incredible to me. 
In the gold space alone, there are four different bullion funds, including GLD, its close competitor IAU, and versions that store gold in Switzerland and Singapore, respectively. Uh, there are two futures funds, including one, UBG, that looks far out the futures curve, and one, DGL, that looks close in. There are even five different mining funds. There are, two, there are three strategy funds. FSG takes a leopard bet on gold versus the S&P 500. SPGH hedges out the S&P 500 with a gold position. And T-Bar uses a 200-day moving average to jump in and out of gold based on momentum factors. And then there are, of course, all the levered and inverse funds. So ETF issuers have certainly realized that this is a strong and growing market and has provided you know, six different avenues for getting exposure to this market. This chart, I think, helps you make the first step through those 26 ETFs. I think for most investors, gold and silver are used as a way to gain counter-correlated exposure to the market. So to construct this table, we've looked at the correlations of the most popular ETFs in each area of the market for spot, futures, and miners, all spread against the S&P 500. One thing that jumps out here is that the correlation between futures and spot is high, as you would expect around 0.9 for both gold and silver. If you move down into the miner space, that correlation to spot drops to about 0.8, still tightly correlated, but perhaps a bit smaller than some people expect. But the most interesting correlations come against the S&P 500. I wouldn't make too much of the fact that futures are lower correlated than spot, but you see in this slide that the miners do have much higher correlations to the S&P 500 than either bullion or futures. That can be good or bad, but it's something investors should understand as they go into that market. This, I realize, is a bit of a seeing eye chart, but I included it so you can review it when you receive these slides by email in a few days. It covers the core statistics for six kinds of ETFs, representing bullion, futures, and miners for both gold and silver. We use the largest ETF in each of those classes to create this chart. A few interesting things are worth calling out here. GLD, the gold, the spider gold bullion ETF, is clearly the powerhouse in the space with more than $56 billion in assets. That's impressive, and the fund trades beautifully, as you can see, with an average daily spread of a penny and massive ADV. But look right next to it at DGL, the futures-based product. It has much smaller assets and trades just a few million dollars worth of shares each day. But even here, the spreads are pretty tiny, average spreads of just five basis points, which I think points to the fact that the underlying securities in this market are incredibly liquid, which makes all of these products relatively easy for market makers to hedge. If you trade carefully in any of these products, you should be able to get uh, good pricing uh, and good liquidity. The other line I'd like to draw your attention to is at the bottom, where we show the short and long-term tax rate for each of these kinds of products. This is perhaps the most important and often the most overlooked aspect of choosing between those, these modalities of gold and silver products. Bullion funds like GLD and SLV are treated as collectibles by the IRS, meaning that no matter how long you own them, they're taxed at a 28% rate for any gains. Futures-based products are taxed at futures, which means all gains are marked to market each year, and they're taxed at 60% long and 40% short-term rates. For wealthy individuals, that creates a 23% tax rate, which is what we show here. And equities, of course, are taxed like stocks, with a 15% rate for long-term holdings. Part of the key decision between stocks, futures, and miners relates to how long you plan to hold the funds, what your tax bracket is, and whether you're positioned in a tax-deferred or taxable account. It's very important in this space. This is my last slide. It, generally, just how do we go about evaluating gold and silver ETFs? At Index Universe, we use a three-step process, which comes with an easy acronym of ETF, uh, to evaluate all products and make sure you're getting the ones you want. The E stands for efficiency, which means does this fund deliver on its core exposure to the market in a way you want? So here you want to consider the expenses of the fund, their tracking performance, which is nearly perfect for bullion and more variable for the other categories, and the tax treatment, as I mentioned above. 
The next step is tradeability, where you should look at the bid-ask spreads, any premiums and discounts, and the volume and liquidity of the ETF, which should be good across most of these products. And finally is fit, which gets to the question of do you really want spot, futures, or equity-like returns? I think each one is right for a different kind of investor, and you just have to make sure that you pick the one that's right for you. So with that, I'll open it back up to Q&A. Uh, as a reminder, once again, as a participant in this webinar, you're invited to ask questions at any time by entering them into the comments section of your webinar screen. You know, I, I really want to uh, have a lot to dig in here, um, but I'm first going to ask a quick question to you, Jason, which is that, you know, Jim made a fairly convincing case that gold has gone up and up and up um, for a long time, and he, he's recently turned bearish on this. I, I guess the question for you is how can gold continue to go up, or what could cause it to, to fall back and go down? Uh, thanks. Uh, that's a very good question. We do get that a lot. Um, I think the simplistic answer beyond saying, you know, more people buying or selling will dictate the price. Um, I think it is important to note that the basis for this uh, this latest gold rally was not uh, due uh, exclusively to the impact of the global financial crisis. As we showed in the, uh, in the price chart, uh, this gold rally began in year 2000. So there were many factors uh, in play. It does not necessarily take a uh, a crisis situation or a massive equity market sell-off around the world for gold to be attractive. Um, having said that, when I look at historical returns such as the gold chart, I say, wow, you know, maybe I should have bought some of this stuff 10 years ago, uh, but where do we go from here? And I, I think it's a very important question, and um, we as an organization, the World Gold Council, we don't predict the gold price itself. Having said that, uh, one of the things we do look very, very closely at and monitor is uh, the segmentations and the dynamics of supply and demand. So I think I, I spoke on the uh, supply side that mine supply, if anything, is declining. It's constant um, with a dwindling identifiable new supply. Uh, we also have a shift of central banks around the world moving from net sellers of gold bullion uh, to net acquirers of gold bullion, and that is a dynamic shift. So you've got a source of supply off the market and uh, at best marginal uh, addition to the uh, demand side, uh, which I think is uh, is quite important. Um, on the demand side, we do have investment. The investment sector is increasing. I should note that that is led by physical bar and coin buying to put the ETF market in perspective. Uh, in year 2010, ETFs, uh, all the gold, physical gold ETFs, accounted for 9% of total gold demand. Uh, since they were launched, they have averaged around 7% of total demand. So they are certainly not the, the big price driver. Uh, it is mostly the jewelry market and the physical bar and coin markets. Now, um, it is difficult to say, you know, why someone should buy uh, gold in a portfolio. Uh, you know, if we are looking to, if I'm 20 years old and looking to retire in 30 to 40 years from now, uh, being aggressive, um, you know, the question is, does gold have a role in my portfolio over that period of time? However, if I'm looking to speculate and trade in a portfolio, uh, then maybe I have a different view towards gold. So maybe I'm looking for more volatility and would look at uh, leveraged products. Um, there's no real way to, um, to really predict the price, and it's really up to each investor to decide the merits um, in their own circumstances. Fair enough. Fair enough. We, we have a, a question for Jim, um, which, you know, feel free to respond to Jason, but I'm going to take this in a, a bit of a different direction, which is... Um, you know, what possibly caused silver to go up so much so recently? And is there a significant risk of mean reversion uh, in the near future uh, between silver and gold? Uh, there's definitely the risk of mean reversion between silver and gold, given that, uh, as the uh, as the member pointed out, the, uh, the recent uh, rise in silver has been basically exponential relative to gold. My view on it is that it's, uh, it's basically reflective of the fact that uh, – 
the gold uh, demand drivers, as Jason had pointed out, really have been building momentum into the price of the metal since uh, 2000, whereas silver, which does trade on a multiple to gold, uh, had some catching up to do. I think also as uh, evidence for uh, economic recovery, not just domestically but globally, uh, began to tilt towards a greater rather than lesser probability, we saw uh, analysts, advisors, individual investors uh, take a little bit more notice of the fact that silver really does have an industrial role to play in that in that overall recovery. And so I think that also contributed to the, uh, the, the most recent sort of uh, outperformance of silver relative to gold. Interesting. And I guess this is a question for you, Jason, taking it in a different direction. Uh, to what extent are major institutions now investing in gold bullion, uh, whether it's through ETFs or directly? And are there any institutions which have formally included gold in their IPS asset mix guidelines? Uh, that's a good one. That's the ultimate goal. I think um, in the grand scheme of things, to put gold investment in context, uh, as a relative proportion of total investable assets around the world, gold represents less than 1%. Uh, of invested assets. So against that backdrop, uh, the market is certainly far from saturated uh, in gold. I would say particularly in the investment sector, uh, uh, institutional investment sector, if we look around the U.S., uh, there's really a handful uh, of pension funds that have discrete allocations to gold in their portfolios, Texas Teachers Pension Fund being one of them. Uh, if we look around the world, there are some, we, we are uh, in contact with some sovereign wealth funds around the world that are allocating to uh, gold discreetly as well, uh, most in a combination of ETFs and physical uh, bullion. So they have uh, certain preferences and, and rationale why they would favor one over the other. Um, and again, there's no, um, I, I think what we're up against and really where a lot of the dialogue is changing is there are a lot of pension funds and institutions around the world that have held commodity index exposure for almost, uh, if, if not over a decade. And we're going back to them and saying, well, you know, if we look at the, the, the merits of that investment and the rationale for investing in commodities in the first place, uh, how did those do for you over the past decade? And, you know, pulling the commodity index space apart and perhaps considering discrete allocations, does that make sense for you as the end investor? And in many cases, those dialogues are ongoing. Um, so we will most likely see more institutions around the world allocating to bullion, uh, to, to gold in the form of bullion and ETFs going forward. Interesting. Jim, I got a, a question for you. Uh, you. You saw my presentation on bullion investment versus the miners. Uh, you didn't mention the miners in your segment. Now, what are your thoughts on, on the mining segment, and, and is that interesting to you at all as an investor? I think you hit the nail on the head, which is basically uh, the miners, one can uh, impose some fundamental evaluative metrics on, and as you do that, uh, they certainly look pricey relative to historic valuations, and that, I think, accounts for their uh, trailing that just the price of gold. Um, I also don't just view um, gold sort of in an absolute sense. As I mentioned, I'm also interested in whether or not there are other or better uh, investment opportunities uh, near intermediate term. And so um, I definitely have a buy in the oil space, not on oil uh, itself, but on the energy service uh, providers, the people that um, you know, deliver the pipelines to the prospectors, the Levi Strauss approach of making your profit whether or not they hit black gold. And so right now, um, I would be uh, shy of the gold miners, but I, I definitely think there's a long-term story, uh, not just because of the rebuilding efforts that have to go on after war-torn uh, regions uh, recover. Um, but also just because of global demand, I think there's a good story for uh, the energy service companies in particular. 
Interesting. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna flip uh, conventional wisdom maybe on its head here and ask a question which came in about deflation. Uh, suppose all the inflation folks are wrong and we enter a period of deflation. Uh, wh what does that do to your view on gold? Maybe Jim first and then Jason quickly. Actually, Matt, if I could, I'd love to hear Jason go first, just because he has the historical data at his beck and call. All right, Jason, it's, for, it's up for you. Deflation and gold. Yeah, gold goes up in all markets. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, there is no. It, it's an interesting question. We have to 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 bear in mind that you know we're we're used to as investors, particularly in this U.S. market, used to isolating particular factors that drive the uh, the return of an asset. So. Uh, in the case of inflation here or deflation uh, in the U.S., uh, unless it is truly a global phenomenon, then it won't have the huge impact on asset returns that we think it would. And a good example of that is, you know, as I mentioned before, a lot of jewelry is sold in India and China. I can guarantee you the marginal buyer at a, uh, a jewelry shop in Chennai, India, is not checking the Wall Street Journal for the CPI estimate. Uh, before making that purchase. Having said that, uh, the question around gold's role as uh, as an inflation hedge we've looked at, we do have more uh, historical returns through deflationary environments on our website. Uh, however, one thing I would note is that prior to 2008, I wouldn't call it a drastic deflationary environment. Uh, but inflation was uh, essentially non-existent. So that is the kind of most recent example, uh, albeit not the, the most uh, dramatic one. And I would just chime right. in and say that if we do, in fact, see uh, deflation triggered, uh, that's, that's likely to uh, refuel the fear trade that's been typically historically good for the price of gold. I mean, to go from where we are today into a deflationary environment will mean that one or more of the pending hurdles that this market's been able, able to overcome so far have actually uh, impeded its ability to do so. So um, while uh, I, I don't hold with those who, who view gold as an inflation hedge, I certainly think if we saw deflation um, sweep back into the market, it would uh, ratchet up the fear trade in favor of gold. Interesting. Tim, a question that's, you know, tied in for you that came in from the audience is, is generally your outlook for the dollar, both short and long term, and if its status as the world's reserve currency will continue? I believe its status as the world's currency will continue. I mean, on any day that we've seen dramatic impingements on the market just over the last 18 months, uh, the flight to quality has not been to treasuries. It hasn't been to gold on those days. It's really been to the dollar. Uh, that said, you know, I, I actually favor a weak dollar just because I tend to be um, more weighted in equities than in fixed income or other types of assets, and a, and a weaker dollar helps our multinational companies' profitability overall. So I'm, 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 I'm overall less worried about the talk about a, a weak dollar, and I'm certainly not concerned that the dollar is somehow going to uh, become uh, worth less over time. It may be worth less from time to time, but not worthless. <laughs> Very good. One more question for you, Jim, and then I have a question for Jason to wrap up. Um, you, what are your thoughts on the other precious metals? Do you ever look at precious metals baskets? Do you look at platinum and palladium? Uh, any interest there? Uh, absolutely. And again, when you're talking about uh, platinum or palladium, you're really talking about metals with, with good industrial applications, the ability to wed fundamentals to your analysis of the of the price and valuation. Um, as Jason, I think, correctly pointed out, with gold, it really is a story of, we've talked about fear trade, we've talked about allocation trade, those are meaningful, but the, uh, the real growth story there has to be uh, the growth in retail consumption and demand coming out of, out of China and India. And if, if that ever dissipates, then, then you're really going to see a world of hurt uh, imposed upon the gold market. Right. Jason, last question to you, and we have uh, we have about a minute and a half for it. So, uh, you mentioned that you thought ETFs had you know really changed the nature of the gold market. Uh, I was wondering just if you could explain what you think those effects have been. I recognize they're not a huge portion of demand at this point, but how have they changed how these markets work? 
Uh, I would say the, the biggest dramatic impact has been on the way we as investors look at gold now. Um, again, and most importantly, within the portfolio context, I mean, it's, it's no surprise when we look at gold, you know, I like to say there's no one on the planet, literally over the age of four years old, that doesn't know what gold is. But the real change in today's environment is the question around, you know, does this stuff have a role to play in my long-term portfolio asset allocation? And the, the shift then has, um, because of the ETFs and the ease of access uh, to gold investment, uh, it's put it on the radar screen. Now, regardless of what the returns have been, yes, it's been a, a very high-performing asset. Uh, yes, it does um, preserve wealth during extreme sell-off, uh, what we'd refer to as tail risk events. Um, will that always be the case? Will gold always go up? Of course not. But uh, the question would be, with the limited data set that we have before us today across all asset classes, you know, how can we as investors, either for ourselves or our end clients, make the most efficient portfolios for the long run, uh, not necessarily next week or the next day? And I think that uh, a lot of the, the, the gold commentary that is in the marketplace, no disrespect to CNBC, but is focused on a daily movement. So how do I trade gold? Is it going up, down, or sideways? I'm not saying that's not a rational investment thesis, but it's not. I wouldn't necessarily call that an investment either. And with the ETFs, again, uh, we're not saying it's the best or the only way to access the gold market. It's a, it's a viable option, uh, which we do think has, uh, has some benefits. But uh, it has moved gold into the mainstream and democratized gold investment and in many circumstances professionalized it. Good answer. Well, thanks. That's, that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank Jim Lowell and Jason Toussaint for joining us. I think we covered a great deal of ground. For those of you who registered for CE credits, including CFP, SEMA, or CFA, which is not listed on this slide, but those credits are available. Forms will follow in the email within a few days to everyone who attended this webinar live, as well as slides uh, and a recording of the audio. So thanks very much for joining us. I hope you join us on future webinars. Have a good afternoon.